Good afternoon. My name is Tamala Olsby from the Texas Education Agency, and I want to welcome you all to this webinar on the lucky day of Valentine's Day. We are going to be discussing, of course, high quality pre-kindergarten classroom environments and specifically what is the teacher's role. If you are having any technical difficulty, the only way I will know it is if you type it into that question or chat box in the control panel on the right. And so if you wouldn't mind doing that, if you are having any difficulty, we'll see if we can fix all of that. Um, there are some handouts also in that control panel that you might wanna go um, print out really quickly. And um, of course, like all of our other webinars, this one is being recorded and it will be posted not only the PowerPoint slides, but the recording um, within a couple of days. It usually takes us a couple of days. Well, I hope you are having a lovely Valentine's Day and um, I am really, really glad you're here. So um, let's just get going here. So today what we're going to discuss very briefly is the review of our last unit when we covered some learning centers. We are ending that discussion. We talked about um, some questions that had come up from several of you, and then we talked about the big thing. So I'm going to remind you of all of that. And then today we will go over the teacher's role and we'll do some reflecting and have some next steps. And then, of course, we always end with resources or support. So let's begin by reviewing Unit 4 briefly. So we covered really two learning centers last time, the Art Center and the Sand and Water Center. And then we briefly talked about some other centers that um, can be used in a pre-kindergarten classroom and that are very, very good. I had to pick like the top six, seven, eight of them. So um, we just ran out of time covering all of these. But we did have a little bit of time to talk to a, a talk about a manipulatives or a fine motor center, a woodworking center, an ABC center, and a technology center. We also talked about a couple of items that have come up um, that, you know, every once in a while I get questions from you all. And we ended up talking about two items that several of you had asked me about. One of them was how many kiddos should be in each learning center? And so we talked about that, that really, you know, I know it's not a good answer, but it really depends. It depends on the size of the classroom. It depends on how many learning centers there are in the room. It depends on the number of students. It depends on the content of the learning centers. So as a general rule of thumb, we talked about take the number of students that you have in the classroom, multiply it by one and a half, and that is approximately how many number of activity slots that you would have. So then you would go around to each of your centers and figure, okay, maybe Blocks has six kids, maybe Art has four, maybe the library has two. You add all of those up and then hopefully this general rule of thumb would help you with that. And remember, this isn't a hard, fast rule. This is guidance from TEA. The next thing that we talked about very briefly in the last unit was how do you introduce learning centers? And one of the reasons why we went over this subject is because remember when we got started, it was like last September. So you all were already actively having class and we really did not take the time to talk about how do you introduce learning centers to young children? So again, there were lots of things to consider. 
how many adults there were in the room, what is the age of the students, how many, again, how many learning centers do you have, and how are the students interacting with those centers. But as a general rule of thumb, we suggested that breast practice was that the teacher would demonstrate and or explain the activities in the learning centers before the students actually use the learning center. And you would begin with activities that could be done very independently and that need very little adult guidance. That helps to introduce them and it, then it, it gives the teacher more time to um, uh, supervise where she needs to. And then we talked about establishing some in quotes, rules about how many kids should be in each center, um, how do you use the materials, um, how you clean up, where do the materials go, that kind of thing. And then lastly, we suggested that you might want to start the beginning of the year with a lower number of, of centers and then add centers when it appears that the students are ready for it. The um, big thing that we talked about at the last unit was the cycle of teaching. And we talked about that this cycle that you see on your screen is really the same in almost any grade level, even adults. Usually there is a teacher teaching. There are students that are learning and then practicing, and then the teacher assesses it what the students have picked up, they go on to more subjects. If the students haven't picked it up, they go back to teaching and practice. And that this cycle is really the same no matter what grade level you're teaching. The difference with little children is that the teaching is usually done in discussions, demonstrations, or direct instruction. But the real difference is that it is for short periods of time. Um, it is not advisable to have a large group time that lasts 45 minutes. It's too long for the um, young child. And so that is probably one of the biggest difference in teaching pre-K is you have to do it in smaller um, sets of direct instruction. And then we would go on to practice. And in the pre-K classroom, most of the time that is done in learning centers. That is the probably the best use of learning centers is to give the children more practice do, um, learning about the items that the teacher has already um, either discussed or demonstrated or direct, directly taught them. And then, of course, you would go to assessment, and then, of course, the cycle um, goes around again. With all of this, it is highly advisable that all of this is done with intentionality. There should be as much intentionality with the teaching, what the teacher might do in large group time, there should be as much intentionality in the learning center's time. And if that is done, that is the best use of a teaching cycle, especially with young children. I honestly think it should be done in almost every grade level, but it is especially true of young children. So that is what we covered in our last unit very briefly. So we're going to go on now to the teacher's role. Um, obviously, this is a huge topic, and um, we're going to focus on what is the teacher's role in regards to the learning environment, since that is our bigger topic. So in regards to the classroom environment, the teacher really has at least four roles. One of them is just to set up the environment. The next one is to align the environment with learning objectives. The next role would be to supervise the use of that learning environment. 
And then lastly, to use the environment to expand the student's learning. We're going to go over each of these now in a little more detail. So the first one was one of the teacher's roles is to set up the classroom environment. And remember way back in, I think, unit one, we talked about that the environment needs to be aesthetically pleasing. It needs to be a place that young kiddos like to go to and they don't want to go home because they're having too much fun at school. So um, that is actually part of the teacher's role. The classroom environment should again have areas of instruction, large group, small group, and individual. The furnishings in that environment need to look like they're age appropriate. And then, of course, there are learning centers that um, need to be set up in the environment. Probably the most important thing about this whole thing is that this is not a one-time event. It should not be that the teacher comes in in late July, early August, sets up her room or his room, and then never touches it again. It is ongoing throughout the school year. The items on the wall, the learning centers, all of that is actually um, changing throughout the school year, um, depending on what the children are learning about. So it is not a one-time event. Another part of the teacher's role is that the environment should definitely connect with whatever the children are learning about. And if someone walked in to one of your pre-kindergarten classrooms, could they walk around the room and say, hmm, I know what they're learning about and be able to tell pretty accurately what they're learning about? Or would it look like I really can't tell? So the closer you can get to, I can tell exactly what they're learning about, the better. So I have a couple of pictures here that I would love for, I'm going to show you the picture. And if you can tell what the students are learning about, if you wouldn't mind uh, typing it into the question or chat box, that would be awesome. So let's look at this first picture. Isn't that adorable? I think that's adorable. So tell me, what, what do you think these kiddos are learning about at school just by this picture alone? Go ahead and type in your answers. I'll give you a little time. All right. It, it could actually be several things. Uh, someone said transportation. Yeah. Um, someone said ocean. Yeah. So. You can't maybe really, really specifically, but it's pretty obvious what the children are learning about. And don't they look like they're having fun? I actually want to go into that classroom. <laughs> Let's look at another picture and go ahead, look at it, and then tell me what you think it is. So what are these students learning about? Okay, it looks pretty obvious that they are definitely learning about farming, a farmer's market. It could be they're learning about things in their community. Um, it could actually be that they're learning about plants. 
growing vegetables, farming. Um, so I, I'm hoping that this is a good example for you of can you tell when you walk into a classroom, when a principal or an administrator or even another teacher is walking in a classroom, can they say for certainty, I know what these kids are learning about? Um, that is a really good, that's really good evidence that the teacher is playing her role of aligning the environment with the learning objectives. The, another part of the teacher's role in um, classroom environment is that there is supervision going on. And obviously, we've talked about this before, um, how health and safety is one of the most important things that teachers need to be concerned about. Um, parents bring their children to us assuming that they are in a clean, healthy, safe environment and that their, their child's needs are being taken care of and that they are being supervised at all times. So the, we don't want to, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on this in any of our units, but we don't just want to ignore it because it is also very, very important. This last role is the one that we're going to spend the majority of our time um, about today. So another part of the teacher's role is to use the environment really as a teaching tool to expand what the kiddos are learning. So I've listed on this slide parts of the school day. So I'd like you to think through what, how could the teacher use the environment in each of these parts of the school day? Um, and how could they be used to expand some kind of learning that is taking place? And again, that would tie in to intentionality. If you were talking about expanding the student's learning and what is that teacher's role, there are, oh golly, a million ways a teacher can do that. I listed as many as I could get on this slide. Um, they include the teacher's role being one of a planner, they have to implement, they're assessing, they're discussing, commenting, questioning, challenging, acknowledging. They are demonstrating, they're listening, they're solving problems, they're supervising, they're modeling, they're introducing and reinforcing concepts, they're observing, they're participating, they're assisting. There's numerous um, actions that the teacher can take in the environment to expand the student's learning. I would, um, we're not going to do it here today just because of time, but I would suggest that this might be a good um, activity to be done with teachers. Go back to the parts of the day and match them to these items that the teacher does during the day. See if parts of the day, there is more discussing, or which parts of the day does the teacher do more listening, whatever. Um, and I do think that that would be an interesting um, activity. Um, to match those two um, parts. When you're looking at the parts of the day, there are parts of the school day that are very teacher directed. And there are parts of the school day that are very student directed. When you're looking at all of this, um, in my experience, and I'm talking about my teaching experience and then my administrative experience, I found myself and I found my teachers feeling most comfortable with the parts of the day that 
I had more control over. For instance, large group time. I don't know if I've ever met a pre-K teacher that doesn't adore large group time. Um, they're picking out the songs, they're picking out what book is going to be read, and they are exercising a lot of the direction of the um, uh, what's being talked about during that part of the day. There is one part of the day here that I think usually becomes more student directed. And of course, um, through our last three months, we've been learning that that really should be the learning center time. During the le learning center time though, what I have found is that teachers are a little unsure of their role. Are they supposed to observe only what the kiddos are doing? Are they supposed to be playing with the students? Um, of course, they're always there to assist if somebody um, needs something, but should they mostly be watching, observing, and assisting, or should they be fully involved in what the students are doing in the learning centers? And I think that is um, the question that we're going to um, spend a little more time on today. This slide, um, this um, text box is taken right out of the Texas Pre-K guidelines. I copied it verbatim. It's on page 26. And it says, many teachers do not perceive that they have a role in children's exploration and play. A descriptive study examining early childhood teachers' beliefs about their role in children's play and related practices indicated that most saw themselves as an observer only there to keep children safe. Of the 65 teachers in the study, only four saw play as an opportunity for making connections with literacy, and as few as 15 viewed it as a time to promote thinking. So obviously there's a little bit of, I'm not sure controversy, that's a little stronger term than probably we should use, but I think there are lots of viewpoints about this. And so, um, I found this um, couple of sentences in the pre-K guidelines I thought described it really, really well. We are going to watch a very short video right now um, that I believe has something to say about the teacher's role during, during learning center time, even though it's not going to say it at all, okay? So um, I want us to watch it, and then we're going to discuss um, how that relates to learning centers. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions, and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher. Thank you. 
I apologize. I'm not sure what happened, so we're just going to leave it alone and let it go again. Sorry. was that it is this serve and return experience is very good for young children and it does help their brain to develop. And basically what that is, is it is adults that are fully engaged in what the child is doing and talking about. And the adult ask questions, hopefully open-ended ones. They comment. They pose alternatives and the child may answer back and then it's the adult's turn again. And hence the word serve and return. It's a back and forth um, process. This back and forth is called serve and return as what you can see in the video. You may have heard it called um, feedback loops. That's what it's called in um, the class instrument, for example. Basically, it's the same thing. So how is that related to the learning environment? So in the, lear in the learning centers, um, there's really probably two huge things that the teacher is during, doing during the learning center time. One is they need to just supervise. Um, you know, the kids are all doing different things. Um, and part of their role is just to make sure the children are safe in what they're doing. Um, but the other part is that they are participating. And that could include observing, demonstrating, discussing, asking questions, challenging, commenting. They're listening, they're helping to solve problems, they're modeling, and they are assisting. And in this perfect scenario, um, the teacher is always looking for ways they could introduce, reinforce, or practice helping the students do all of that, any new um, concept or skill. And the fully, the more engaged the teacher is in doing all of this, um, uh, the better outcomes that usually students have. We're going to look at another um, quote from another really good book. If you do not have this book, um, let's see, Christmas is too far away. Um, but this is a really, really, really good book. It's called Getting It Right from the Start, The Principles Guide to Early Childhood Education. And I copied this from page 152. It says, adults supervise the centers by moving about the room. 
checking in with children and offering instruction as appropriate. In team teaching situations, one or more adults may be stationed in a particular center or group of centers carrying out given lessons for some or all of the session. In such circumstances, another adult serves as the center manager, moving from center to center as needed. In each case, both teacher and children interact with and learn from each other. This learning involves a constant exchange of thoughts and ideas. Teachers observe, listen, instruct, guide, support, and encourage their students. Likewise, children ask questions, suggest alternatives, express interest, and develop plans. These interactions move the instruction forward, sometimes leading it to a new direction. In this way, teachers keep their long range objectives in mind and at the same time, keep their moment to moment decisions flexible in order to capitalize on input, input from the child and to meet children's educational needs more effectively. That is serve and return. Um, and look at part of what this says. The teachers are moving about the room. They are checking in with students. They are offering instruction as appropriate. And the one I really, really, really um, like to emphasize is that there is a constant exchange of thoughts and ideas. So when you walk into one of your pre-K rooms, it should be active, especially if it's at the learning center time. There should be noise in the room. There should be talking in the room. It should not be quiet. Um, and I think that often is um, misunderstood in pre-K work. Notice in this paragraph that it talked about um, a kind of a solo teacher as well as a team teaching situation. So in this serve and return pattern that we are trying to establish in pre-K, it does appear that there are numerous ways of doing it. Um, and a lot of that is dependent upon whether you have one teacher in the room or more than one teacher in the room. Some of it is dependent upon whether this is also the time that you do small group instruction. So a common practice in pre-K is to have the learning centers the children are actively involved in those, and there is a teacher and or a para supervising that and doing all the things that you see circled here. And then there might be another teacher that could be at a learning center, and they're using that time for small group instruction and or individual instruction if that is what is needed. So I am pretty sure that after we talked about that, that there might be some questions. So I want to give you the opportunity to ask some specific questions if you have them right now. Um, any questions about this serve and return, um, how you do it with one teacher, two teachers, all of that? Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of time to kind of reflect on that.
Okay, well, I'm not seeing any, so we're just going to go on um, and um, we're going to do some reflecting for our activity this month. Um, so um, I created a list of questions that perhaps could be used either with administrators and then another set of questions to be used for teachers. Because what we just heard in this webinar probably is new to some of you. Some of you, this will be like, no, this is basic early childhood 101, but it could, and it might be a good reminder for others of you. So because of that, um, I, I would really like you during the next couple of weeks to spend some time thinking about what is in this webinar and what you see going on in your pre-K classrooms. So if you're an administrator, you might be thinking of how could I guide and assist my teaching staff in choosing age appropriate activities so that they can even do serve and return? Are the activities done in the pre-kindergarten program balanced between being, between being teacher directed and student directed? Are the students on task and are they engaged in every part of the day? Can I tell what students are learning by looking at the environment of the room? And how are my teachers spending their time during le learning center time? Um, are they moving around the room or are they sitting? Are they writing lesson plans during this time? Are they assessing children, which might be perfectly normal at certain times of the year? Are they talking? Um, are they playing? Um, what, what are they spending their time doing? I also created, like I told you, a, a list of questions that if you want to, you might want to have your teachers reflect on. Um, were, and they might uh, include these. Were the activities I planned for the day, were they good? Were they successful? Did they do what I wanted them to do? Were the activities balanced between teacher direction and student direction? Were my kiddos on task? Were they engaged all the way through the day? Can someone tell what my students are learning about by walking into my classroom? And how am I spending the time during learning center time? What am I spending most of my time doing? So our next steps for this unit are, obviously we had the webinar today, our next activity would be to actually um, reflect on the last two slides that we just um, showed you. And you could do that by simply reflecting yourself. Or if you wanted to share part of this um, uh, webinar with the teachers and then have a discussion with them and have them reflect on it, I think uh, whatever you are willing to do and what you feel comfortable doing, that's really what we want you doing. And then at our PLC, which is scheduled for the week of, uh, well, actually it's on February 26th at 10 o'clock, where I'm hoping that some of you will share. You know, what, what were your reflections like? What did you think about? What out of all of this information do you think, how could you share it with teachers and, um, and um, what improvements might need to be made? And then again, the next week, we would have an individual phone call with each of you. And that would be, believe it or not, that's in March. I can't believe how fast this time is going. Um, 
we always have resources and support for you. And um, I have been trying to use all of these books and you'll notice that I change page numbers so that you'll know exactly where I'm getting the content. I have also added a book this time. It is the one, two, three, four, fifth book down called Developmentally Appropriate Curriculum. It's kind of an old book, but it's really, really good. So I ended up putting it on there. And obviously, we've talked about this many times. We want you to check out our website. And if you have any questions, I am, am ready and willing to help and assist you in any way we can. So our takeaways today are that we uh, did a little bit of a review. We talked about the teacher's role. We um, heard about our next activity with these reflections and our next steps. And I wanna close our day with this, I think really, really, really good quote. When the play environment is intentionally created, the learning that occurs is as deliberate and logical as in any teacher directed lesson. Yet the activities are offered in a manner that is appropriate to the development of each child. That is awesome. Um, I am, I feel very blessed that we got to share this time. Um, and uh, again, we will um, put the PowerPoint slides and the recording of this session on our website. I'll send you an email when that is done and then um, spend some time reflecting about what we talked about today. And then I will look forward to um, seeing you and hearing you at our next PLC in later February. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.